Here are five formulas every electrician should know. Number one is Ohm's law. Most electricians know this like they know nothing else with math. It's Ohm's law and Ohm's law is specifically the relationship between voltage, amperage and resistance only. Does not put into any uh, power uh, efficiency, anything like that. Once you start getting into power, you're talking about the transferring of power from one thing to another thing. And that is a uh, process of joules. So uh, the, the next one we will talk about is once we introduce power into this, but Ohm's law again, voltage, amperage, resistance. Now, if you wanna solve for one of these, you just cover the one you're trying to solve for and it tells you what equation to, to use. So with Ohm's loss, there's three different ways that you can structure it. So you could do the first one, E equals I times R. If you're trying to solve for voltage, E equals I times R. Just remember they're right next to each other, I times R. If you wanted to solve for amperage, you could sit and try to like divide out the R and move everything over, or you could just look at this and be like, I'm trying to solve for I, so cover I, it's E over R. So super simple. And lastly, as you would expect, R equals E over I. So that tool, that little chart is really good because then otherwise you'd have to like do all of this math and try to multiply by things and, and like move things around. But if we have an amperage that's 20 amps times a six ohm resistor, it's gonna be 120 volts. If you're trying to figure out how many amps is it, I got a 120 volt circuit and I know this resistor is six uh, ohms, you just divide and you get 20 amps. But if you don't know what the resistance is of a resistor, but you know that this thing is drawing 20 amps and it's a 120 volt circuit, you can just divide that and figure out six ohms. So this is a really, really helpful thing to use. Next is going to be Joule's law. So a lot of people don't call this Joule's law, but that's what it is. Joules is the amount of energy that's produced by something or that's transferred from one system to another system. So when we're talking about electrical energy going through a light bulb, we're talking about the amount of energy that is coming from the electrical energy in the electrical circuit, and then is being produced or transferred into another kind of energy like light and heat in the case of like an incandescent bulb. So Joule's law is usually a function of time. So usually in a formula, they're gonna have time as a function, but amperage includes time. So amperage is a rate, so it's current that's flowing per second. So it already factors that in. So we can call this Joule's law and use it as such. So very similar kind of thing, instead of uh, E equals I times R, now we have P equals uh, I times E. I just think of pi. Yummy pi. P-I-E, pi. Uh, that's how I think of it. So the one thing, if we're trying to solve for how many uh, watts of like light bulbs that we have, um, what's the total wattage of a circuit once we turn all these bulbs on? Well, we know it's a 120 volt circuit and uh, we know that it, it's drawing 20 amps. So how much total power is that? Um, it's gonna be 2400. So we could take all of these values and the same thing, all of them are true. If we're trying to figure out how much current draws in a circuit, well, we know we have 2400 watts in a circuit and say we're trying to figure out like 20 amp breaker, you know, 20 amp circuit. Well, if it's two, uh, 2400 watts that we have to deal with divided by 120, then that's gonna be 20 total amps for that circuit. You could also do the inverse. So say that we're trying to figure out, um, figure things out for what the total wattage of a circuit is. If we have a 20 amp breaker, 120 amps, then we have 2400 watts to play with in a 20 amp circuit. That's another like helpful thing out in the field. Um, so anyways, lastly, if we're trying to solve for voltage, which you're never gonna do, um, you're gonna take the power, whatever the, the wattage is, divide that by 20 amps, if you're testing 20 amps, and it should be 120 volts. So they all organize nice and neatly. Again, rather than doing the math to try to figure out and like divide by E to isolate I and move E over here, <laughs> you don't have to remember all that, just remember the pie chart. Next up is voltage drop. So voltage drop is something we're very frequently gonna come across in the field. You can actually use Ohm's law to do a voltage drop calculation without all the extra variables. It's just slightly off. It's not gonna be as accurate, but kind of like gets you relatively close. But a better way to do voltage drop is to actually use voltage drop formulas. You know, I have two here. One of them is VD, voltage drop. The other one is VD3. 
um, for three phase. So anytime you do three phase, you have to introduce 1.732 into the formula. Uh, it's also the square root of three. So the square root of three equals 1.732. So you're gonna notice the formulas then are very similar. One of them is two times a bunch of craziness. The other one's 1.732 times a bunch of craziness, which that means this is a smaller number you're multiplying by so that typically in a three phase circuit, there's gonna be slightly less voltage drop. Voltage drop is more expressed in a single phase circuit. All right, so voltage drop, let's do an example. So the two, I, I think of it, there's two conductors, right? You have there and back. We have length, which is L. Um, so if you have 100 feet, you're not gonna measure 100 feet one way and 100 feet back the other way. That's what that two is for. So the two, two conductors at 100 feet. That's how I remember the two and the L. The K is a constant that we use depending on the type of material that we're using. So if we're using a copper conductor, the conductivity or resistivity of a certain conductor is gonna be different. So aluminum is a little bit less conductive than copper is. So copper, um, you're not gonna experience as much of a voltage drop as you are for the same size conductor in aluminum just because they don't conduct as well. There's just more resistance with the material. So K, the coefficient for K for copper is 12.9. So every single one of these that you ever do, you're gonna use 12.9 for copper. If it's going to be aluminum, K is going to be 21.2. So just memorize those two numbers and never forget them the rest of your life and you'll be fine. So anytime you're doing aluminum stuff, use that. Anytime you're using copper, use that. So that covers the two, the K. I is your amperage. How, how like if we had a motor or something, that's a 20 amp motor out in the field, you're gonna plug in whatever that is going to be. So that takes care of everything on the top. The bottom is not centimeters, it is circular mills. So every conductor has a certain diameter, which means it also has an area. And the area of that conductor or the cross-sectional area, if you slice the thing in half, the cross-sectional area of it is measured in mills or circular mills. So a circular conductor is gonna be circular mills. So every conductor has a certain size circular mills. Number 12, I know for 20 amps, is gonna be 6,530. Just remember that, remember that number because most of the time you're gonna be dealing with number 12 conductors and trying to see what the voltage drop is on that sized conductor. So the cross-sectional area of number 12 is gonna be 6,530. Um, now, one thing to keep in mind, if you're ever dealing with like 250 KC mil or 250 MCM or like 500, 600, you're talking big conductors, the 600 actually means 600,000 circular mils. So those are really easy. Once you get past four out, you start 250, 300, 350, all of that. That's actually talking about the circular mills. So uh, otherwise, chapter nine, table eight, NEC, um, it's gonna have all of these values in there uh, for each specific one. So beyond all of that, like that's what we're plugging into the formula. So an example is, say we've got a single phase voltage drop that we're trying to calculate. We've got a 100 foot distance, there's two conductors, they're copper, so it's 12.9, it's a 20 amp load, divided by number 12 conductors, which is 6,530, and we get eight volts. So in this situation, over 100 uh, feet, if we have a 20 amp motor on copper conductors, it's number 12, we're gonna experience an eight volt drop when we hit that thing and actually start it up. It's gonna drop the whole voltage of the circuit. Now for three phase, again, we see this 1.732 thing, square root of three, right? because it's three phase. So everything three phase, we gotta add this 1.732 thing. So we have square root of three times 21.2 this time. Instead of copper, we're gonna say we're using aluminum just to see what that does. Still a 20 amp load, still 100 feet away, and we're still using number 12. It's just number 12 aluminum this time. Do all of the math and we figure it's an 11 volt drop. So other than we changed and put 1.732 instead of two, this voltage drop, if it were both single phase, just changing the aluminum conductors would have still made this thing drop a lot more volts. It's actually less of a voltage drop because we're in a three phase circuit. So it would probably be higher, maybe 12 volts if we were just doing single phase. But even when you go up in uh, aluminum for that higher coefficient, you go down because it's three phase, just slightly. Next up, you're gonna see this on every damn test you're ever gonna take, <laughs> electrical theory. This stuff sucks, especially once you start getting into RLC circuits where you've got resistance, inductance, and capacitance um, in series and in parallel. And sometimes when you're doing capacitance, these formulas for capacitance are actually completely inversed. So capacitance in a parallel circuit is gonna look like this. Capacitance in a series circuit is gonna look like this. But not to digress, 
series and parallel resistance. If you're trying to figure out the total resistance of a series circuit, you just add all the resistances together. It's the sum of all of them. It's super easy to do. You're in series, you're just adding one after the other. So the total resistance or RT is equal to the first resistance, second resistance, third resistance, and as many resistances as you got, you just keep adding them all together. Where it gets kind of wonky is when we get to parallel resistance. Parallel resistance, you have to take the inverse of the sum of inverses. There's a different method, uh, product over sum. We'll get to that here in the next slide. But it's a weird thing, right? So I just usually do like one divide, if it's a three ohm resistor or something, I do one divide by three plus one divided by two plus one divided whatever. And you get that sum and then you take one divided by whatever that sum is and that's what you get. So you'll see the dramatic inverse effect on putting resistors in a series circuit than you will in a parallel circuit. All right, series and parallel. So here we have a series circuit. We've got R1, R2, and R3. There are three different resistors. R1 is two ohms, R2 is three ohms, R3 is four ohms. So we're doing series, right? They're all in series. So we're gonna do the sum of all resistances method. We're gonna take the total resistance equals R1, R2, and R3 all added together. So we got two plus three plus four, two, three, four. That's nine ohms of resistance. That's a lot of resistance because we have each one of them in series. So it's adding more and more resistance to the circuit when we try to apply pressure or voltage. The next method is the reciprocal over the sum of reciprocals. Um, so we were gonna take still R1, R2, and R3, but in this circuit, we're in parallel rather than in series. So we've got resistor one, two ohms, still three ohms, still, and four ohms still. We're just putting them in parallel in the circuit instead. And what we get is uh, one over one half, right? Because of the two, plus one third because of the three, plus one fourth because of the four. We add all that up and then we take the reciprocal of it and it's 0.9 ohms rather than nine ohms. So we actually get the inverse number um, because it's going through, current is traveling through the circuit differently. It's not just one resistance being added to each. Current's gonna go everywhere in this circuit, but there's nothing impeding it um, in a row in order. So um, you can sit and mess around with that and have fun if you want to, but I find an easier method of going about it is just to use the product over sum method. So you can do this craziness if you want to, but it's also possible to just do each one of the resistances times each other and then put over each one of the resistances added to each other. So the product, two times three times four, the product over the sum to plus three plus four and you get the same exact number. So super helpful. You're gonna run into lots of that once you start getting into taking your electrical theory exams. So have fun. Last one we're gonna talk about is horsepower. And we're specifically talking about the output of a motor. What is it gonna put out based off the conditions of the circuit and the conditions of the motor? Not talking about just converting uh, a watt to a horsepower because one horsepower equals roughly 746 watts. That's another number. Just remember that if you're ever trying to think of like, hey, one horsepower motor, what does that produce? 746 watts, roughly. But there's a lot more things to factor with a motor. Some motors are a lot more efficient than other motors. A lot of them have a rating on them and it'll say EFF and it'll give you efficiency of like 90% or 0.9. So it's not 100% efficient, it's only 90% efficient. So that's gonna change the dynamics of the output of that motor. Another thing is you could have a power factor problem. So you might be in a building that's got a lot of inductive loads, like maybe tons of motor loads. Well, the overall power factor of that circuit is going to change the nature of the output of that motor. So. Um, we're gonna be putting in voltage, amperage, the efficiency of the motor, the actual power factor for the circuit, and we're gonna divide by 746, right? Because one horsepower equals 746 watts. So to figure out what the true horsepower of this motor is, let's look at an example. So we're gonna be single phase, three phase. Again, we got the square root of three thing, right? Three phase. So let's look at a single horsepower motor. We're gonna take the voltage times, uh, say it's a 240 volt circuit. We got a 20 amp motor. The efficiency on the motor actually says that it's only an 80% efficient motor, so not very great. And the power factor is kind of crazy at 0.7. So unity power factor would be one if it's 100% power factor. That means your voltage and your, uh, your amperage, when you apply voltage, is immediate amperage. There's no like delay or lag reactance that's happening. 
um, then you're gonna have one, but anything that's worse than that is gonna be like below one. So 0.7 is a pretty terrible power factor. Then we're gonna divide by 746. So we do all the math, single uh, phase horsepower, and we get 3.6 horsepower. Now that's not the actual horsepower rating, sizing your conductors and doing amperage and all of that stuff off of that. You're gonna use 430 in the National Electrical Code, uh, 247, 248, 249, and 250. And that's gonna be you know single phase, three phase, DC. So now when we look at a three phase situation, we have to add the 1.732. So that's, that's going to help our number a little bit because we're actually adding more. It's not like two times everything, but it is 1.732 times everything. So square root of three is 1.732 times 240 volts, same circuit, uh, 20 amps, 0.9 on the efficiency this time. So this is a much more efficient motor, but power factor is still 0.85, which is still better than it was um, and then we're dividing by 7.46 and we get 8.5 horsepower out of that uh, circuit. Now this is a three phase circuit, right? We got three conductors going into it. It's on a three phase breaker and we're hooking it up. So there's gonna be just naturally more power transfer between three phase circuit and a three phase motor. Whereas a single phase, we've got two conductors um, that are probably pulsing a lot differently, but typically um, horsepower output for a three phase motor is gonna be slightly greater than it is for a single phase motor. If we were to keep all the numbers the same, the equations would be the same, but you would have 1.732 times the output of that motor. So it's actually gonna be more output on a three phase motor than it is on a single phase motor. So those are all of your formulas. That's actually not all of them. If you really wanted to get into capacitance or you wanted to get into like inductive reactants, capacitive reactants, you wanna get into RLC circuits, there's more stuff to learn. There's quite actually, there's quite a few more like formulas that you might want to know if you want to get into like trig or calculus, weird stuff like that. But we don't because this is YouTube and we're all dummies. <laughs> Just kidding. I love you, YouTube. All right. I'll see you crazy people in the next one. Thanks for watching.